that were emitted from non-combustion processes, like, for example, natural gas processing that does release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The rate at the tax of the tax was assigned depending on how much carbon content there is per unit of fuel. And so diesel had a slightly higher tax rate than gasoline. The next bullet is a really critical one. It was scheduled to rise for five years, starting July 1st of 2008. And every July 1st for the next four years, it was going to go up by $5 per ton, reaching $30 per ton on July 1st of 2012. That we did. It had minimal bureaucracy. In fact, the finance department in the province of British Columbia did not have to employ a, a, any additional staff to oversee the tax. There was not a single new employee recruited in British Columbia associated with the carbon tax. It's also applied at the wholesale distribution points where large scale volumes of gasoline and diesel and propane and natural gas and so on are distributed. And there's only six such points in British Columbia. And so it was very easy to apply the tax at that wholesale distribution level. Finally, the last key point here is that it was revenue neutral and by law, the legislation required that every penny of the revenue collected from the carbon tax was required uh, to be used to reduce other taxes. Going on to the next slide. As a result of that revenue neutrality provision, British Columbia enjoys the lowest personal income tax in Canada. That's up to $122,000 of taxable income. And it has amongst the lowest corporate income taxes in the OECD countries. We reduced our personal income tax by 5% in each of the lower two progressive income strata in the province. And we reduced our corporate income tax by 3% initially in 2008, or 2008, 2009 period. We in, employed uh, fairness provisions so that the tax is socioeconomically uh, egalitarian in the sense we have special dispensations for people who live in the north where conditions are colder, they might require more fossil fuel for heating purposes, for example or people who live in rural settings and may have uh, longer commuting distances, that sort of thing. So those individuals and families in British Columbia receive up to $200 per year. We have a low income action, climate action tax credit for families. And so low income people benefit directly with subventions. They receive a check three, uh, four times a year, quarterly uh, from the government uh, to offset the cost of the carbon tax. We did apply some specific exemptions for the agricultural sector starting in 2009, 2010, uh, in response to the needs of the greenhouse growing sector, for example, that had uh, very high fossil fuel requirements. So they did receive some specific exemptions. Then we had a big change in our politics in British Columbia. And in late 2011, our Premier, who had been the climate action champion, his name was Gordon Campbell, he resigned and he was replaced with uh, a woman named Christy Clark. And Miss Clark or Premier Clark decided that she would freeze the carbon tax uh, as of June 30th of 2013. So the last increase was on July 1st, of 2012. There was no increase on July 1st of 2013. Gordon Campbell initially had intended that the carbon tax would increase, would continue to go up beyond 2013. Premier Clark made a, a different decision. Her rationale for doing that was that other jurisdictions had not followed British Columbia's lead and that in order to maintain our competitive position in world markets, uh, we would not uh, raise the tax further until others followed. Here's the impact. You'll see data on the screen now. Note that this is all fossil fuel consumption per capita, starting in the year 2000, running up to July, um, sorry, June 30th of 2013. The vertical axis is terajoules per capita, which is a, a unifying um, method to be able to include all fossil fuels on a common yardstick. 
time across the bottom. If you look between 2000 and 2007, 2008, you'll see that British Columbia's fuel consumption per capita tracked the rest of Canada. Uh, it was also lower than the rest of Canada. That's because we have a hydroelectric uh, system here for producing our electricity in the province. We don't burn coal in British Columbia. So we were lower than the rest of Canada as a result of that. And then the change happened on July 1st of 2008. And you'll notice that after that, the next five years, our per capita fossil fuel consumption went down progressively over those five years. The rest of Canada went slightly up over those five years. And so our, by the end of our tax period, when the last uh, increment was applied on July 1st of 2012, our fossil fuel consumption on a per capita basis was 19% below that of other Canadians, which is really a remarkable uh, change. And we do attribute that decline in our fossil fuel consumption to the carbon tax. It, it applied to all, all tools, uh, all fuels, I should say. If you look at the next slide, propane, uh, British Columbia in green, the rest of Canada in blue. All of these changes now are in percentage changes per capita in terajoules per capita. Propane consumption went down, gasoline consumption went down, diesel consumption went down, fuel oil consumption went way down, but there was a regulatory change in there as well that banned high sulfur fuels. So that one had an extra kick in reducing the consumption of fuel oil. Petroleum coke, that's used largely in the cement industry to fuel the needs of uh, producing cement, that also went down as the cement industry switched to other fuels, natural gas and uh, biomass in particular. And natural gas consumption went down to, relative to the rest of Canada. So across the full spectrum of fossil fuels, we saw declines. The next slide shows what happened economically. Just in terms of our gross domestic product, you'll note that the left axis is in trillions of dollars uh, from British Columbia. The right-hand axis is the Canadian GDP, which is about 10 times higher, but they are equally scalable. And you'll note that they are parallel. Uh, British Columbia's economy grew at least as fast as Canada's over the, the years in which the tax was in full force. So let me summarize now. Key design points that I think other administrations might take to heart. The first is, that the tax, if it's to be effective, must accelerate. You must schedule it for some several years in advance, ideally decades in advance. The, the message you want to deliver to society is that the price of fossil fuel combustion is going to go up. And it actually doesn't matter so much what the quantum is. $10 per ton initially for us and $5 per year. The public was not aware of that number. But what the public in British Columbia did hear was the word up. And it's that word up that we think changed behavior here in British Columbia. Revenue neutral, that's a, an important characteristic, I think, of a taxation policy like this because it actually um, produces a, a taxation shift rather than a tax. <clears throat> it was fair. We made sure that we put tax reductions in place and supports, direct fiscal supports for the lower income earners in our society. And bureaucratically, as I mentioned before, it was very simple to, to put in place. In terms of issues, <clears throat> there were some negative issues. There were more positive issues. The first of those, the revenue neutrality issue, because it is a tax shift and income taxes and corporate income taxes were reduced, that took away the ability of the opposition to claim that this was just yet another tax grab. It was a tax shift. It was not a tax grab. It did not generate new revenue for the province. The competitive disadvantage issue remains an issue in British Columbia because other jurisdictions have not followed our lead. In 2008, we thought they would. But some are starting to now. Alberta put a carbon tax in place starting in January of this year. We expect other jurisdictions will soon have uh, significant taxes in place, but that does remain an issue for us. In the political world, 
our conservative party, which they, they call themselves the British Columbia Liberal Party, but they are very conservative. They were reelected a year after the tax was put in place. And the left wing progressive party known as the New Democratic Party in Canada, they did something very stupid. They decided that they could gain votes in Northern British Columbia in the provincial election of 2009 by leading a campaign called Axe the Tax. It was stupid, they regret it now, and it cost them perhaps 3% of the popular vote, allowing the BC Liberal Party to be reelected in 2009. The fourth point is that tax shifting is very poorly understood in British Columbia. One thing the government did not do well is communicate the value of the tax design and the fact that income and corporate income taxes were fairly significantly reduced uh, using and uh, supported by a revenue from the carbon tax. That remains a challenge, I think, for communication for the government with the uh, British Columbia society. And lastly, our economy, and in terms of the clean technology sector, was definitely stimulated by the advent of the carbon tax. And uh, that uh, sector of our economy continues to grow. The last slide is responses to BC's carbon tax. Around the world, it is considered, and the first one at the top, uh, Professor Paul Leakins, who was uh, the chairman of the Green Fiscal Commission in the United Kingdom, appointed by Gordon Brown when he was prime minister describes it as amongst the best, uh, best, best designed measures of its kind in the world. He also described it as a template for the world. The Secretary General of the OECD, Angel Guria, has said it's as, as near as we have to a textbook case. And our former chief statistician pointed out that it's good economic policy. We are on the right track. So I will stop there and uh, look forward to hearing Anita's presentation. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so we'll switch it over to Anita. Okay. Hi, everyone. Is that working? Is that working? Yep. That's perfect. Great. Thanks, Audrey, and thanks, Tom. Um, I'm just going to start off by apologising. I actually have a cold, so I'll do my best to uh, to uh, push through and tell you a little bit about carbon pricing in Australia or our history of it. Um, I'm going to feed off a little bit what Tom said because I think it's a great way to compare the two. Um, so I'll, uh, maybe that will make the interest it make it a bit more interesting in the question section at the end. So I'm going to focus less on the details of the scheme because that's not really where the lessons are for Australia. So I'm going to tell you about the history of carbon price in Australia because we also don't have a carbon price anymore, but we did. A little bit about the details of the scheme, and then a bit more about the politics and, uh, and what I think the lessons are in there. So the history of carbon pricing in Australia starts in 2007 uh, with the election of Kevin Rudd, which is that pretty face on the left of your screen. Um, Kevin Rudd is a Labor politician, a left-wing politician that was elected after we've had 11 years of a Conservative government in Australia under John Howard. Going into that 2007 election, um, <clears throat> Both candidates actually uh, were looking towards the Mission Australian Scheme. John Howard had actually said that Australia needs one. So it was the only time in Australian history that we had that sort of bipartisan approach um, towards emissions trading. Kevin Rudd won the election and as a pretty symbolic move, his first act as Prime Minister was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol for Australia. The next thing he did was that he got um, distinguished economist Ross Garneau to undertake a review of climate policy options for Australia. Um, and Garneau recommended that Australia's most cost-effective way of reducing emissions was through an emissions trading scheme. So off the back of that, Kevin Rudd and his deputy, Julia Gillard, who's the photo in the middle, um, they uh, consulted quite um, broadly with industry and came up with what they call the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, which is that first scheme on the left of your screen. <clears throat> I've put a big cross at that because that scheme never got off the ground. So it was essentially <clears throat> uh, an emissions trading scheme, which is different from a carbon tax. And uh, uh, we can, I guess, Tom and I could explain afterwards what the differences are there. But it was essentially an emissions trading scheme that started off with uh, one year of a fixed price 
of $10 to help the transition into what was going to be a much higher than $10 carbon price. Now, that scheme was entered twice into Parliament and failed twice in Parliament. It didn't have support of the opposition. The Conservative opposition thought that it was too hard on industry. It also didn't have the support of the Greens, who thought that it was too soft on industry. So it never got through. And, in fact, it, um, it led to a leadership spill within the government and Julia Gillard, who was deputy, became prime minister uh, and then won the election in her own right. Um, when she won the election, she formed what was called the Multi-Party Climate Change Committee, which, as the name suggests, brought together uh, members from every party. Um, she was a minority government. She needed the independence to have government. Uh, and to the, the discussion at the committee was around climate change and what to do. The opposition refused to take part in that committee, so they didn't have a voice. The Climate Change Committee essentially came up with the emissions trading scheme as the best solution for Australia's um, climate policy. And given that so much work was put into that initial carbon pollution reduction scheme, a lot of, in fact, the basis of the new scheme was really that CPRS. A lot of that, um, that scheme was just carried across into the new scheme, which ended up being an emissions trading scheme, this time with a three-year fixed price um, period at the beginning of $23 a permit and a lot more household assistance, so low-income assistance, than the previous scheme. So this passed Parliament in 2011 and came into force in 2012. So that's when Australia had a carbon price. I will mention that as part of that, so firstly, it, the, the Greens and the independents were needed for their votes to get that through the Parliament. That's a key point. Um, and the other thing is that with that, the government also passed something called the Carbon Farming Initiative, which is the third one on your third column on your screen. Carbon Farming Initiative was an offset scheme, still is an offset scheme. An offset scheme works in such a way that, um, so the emissions trading scheme covers certain sectors, um, but sectors that aren't covered by that, in this case the land sector, so agriculture and forestry, could actually participate in that scheme on a voluntary basis. They could Farmers could reduce emissions on their land and then sell the permits into the scheme. Now that passed with support from the Conservatives because um, uh, the farming sector in Australia, the nationals are Conservative and they saw this as a benefit to them that was passed into Parliament. Um, so the Clean Energy Act was in force for two years and it was repealed in 2014 when Tony Abbott won um, government, Conservative government came back in, uh, and they, in contrast to what Tom just said, they were the Conservative government that campaigned on Axe the Tax and it was a successful campaign. Now the next slide has quite a lot of detail on it and I'm not expecting you to look at that, but this is more if you want to refer to it at a later stage. But if we focus on that second column, the Clean Energy Act, which is where uh, we had a carbon price in Australia. Basically, the main points are that um, it, it ticked all the boxes. So it had a 5% um, a uh, reduction target for 2020 to start with, but a long-term target of 80% by 2050, which is the same as the British Columbian scheme target that, or the long-term target as Tom described. Uh, the coverage was 60% um, of Australian emissions plus those that were covered under the land sector from the carbon farming initiative, and that equated to about 500 companies that were liable. It had this um, support for households. Um, it also had industry support, which declined at 1.3% per year. Now, was it an effective scheme? What are the strengths and weaknesses? If we look to the um, criteria that, that Tom gave us previously, he, he said that the BC scheme was unique, comprehensive, simple and effective. Well, certainly the scheme in Australia was unique. Um, it was specially designed for Australia, for Australian circumstances and for Australian interests. Comprehensive, I'd say it was comprehensive because it did cover um, the major emitting sectors and it also um, gave options to the land sector to, to participate as well. I wouldn't say it was simple, it was a bit of a monster. Uh, it actually included a number of um, bills and a number of uh, amendments to other existing legislation. But was it effective? Now, this graph or graphs like this are often shown to argue that the carbon price was effective in Australia. So if we look at the top line, which is the most relevant one, it's electricity emissions. Um, for Australia, that's the low hanging fruit because our electricity sector is so highly emitting. We can see that it was a steady increase up until about 2008-9. 2008-9 was the global financial crisis. Emissions went down in most places around the world. 
Australia was no exception. So emissions did go down. And then when we, we weren't hit as hard as many other countries. So emissions started to um, creep back up quite quickly. And we were doing all right in 2010, 2011. And then we see this dip again in 2012, 13, which is often said to be due to the carbon price. Now, whether this is the case, um, I think it's it's a bit of a, a bit of a stretch to say that that was due to the emissions trading scheme. The simple reason that it's too soon, it was too soon to tell. The scheme was only in place for two years and it wasn't a full effective two years. I'll explain why that is. A carbon price works by sending a signal. It sends a signal to the market. It says carbon's going to be more expensive. You need to change your behaviour. You need to change your technologies. Um, and that's how it is effective. However, because the opposition campaigned so heavily from the very moment that the carbon price was in place, it campaigned on this axe the tax um, uh, platform, industry knew that this, if the new government, if the government changed in 2013, the scheme would be repealed. So that signal was really muffled. It wasn't a clear signal. It was more of a, well, let's just keep our emissions down for the next year or so, and then we'll be in the clear. We don't need to make large investments into low um, carbon technologies or processes. So that's the first point. The second point is that the carbon price was passed with a number of other different initiatives, particularly in the renewable energy sector. So it had to disaggregate the effects of those schemes and the carbon price itself is quite difficult. Um, another point is that uh, in 2008-9, um, Obama in the US passed a number of clean tech stimulus packages that was to stimulate innovation in that um, in the renewable energy sector. And it's likely that a lot of those innovations have slowly over the number of years passed through to technology changes in Australia and elsewhere that would have had a dampening effect on emissions as well to some extent. And the final and also key point is that hydropower in Australia um, saw the writing on the they knew that there was a carbon price in place and it was likely that, that carbon price was going to disappear. And so rather than employing a usual strategy that they would have had if it was a long-term carbon price, they ran down a lot of their reserves to get these windfall economic benefits while the carbon price was in place. So they, they, I guess they took advantage much more of the carbon price than they would have if it was going to be a long-term scheme, which pushed that downward trend um, to be a lot steeper than it would otherwise have been. So for all these reasons, it's very hard to say whether the Australian scheme was effective. Emissions certainly didn't go up, um, but we needed more time to find out whether it would indeed have been effective. Mm -hmm. And that's why, um, while it ticks all the boxes, so it was um, uh, a comprehensive scheme, it was, um, it was a scheme that accelerated over time, so the cap came down over time. Uh, it was revenue neutral, so um, all of the income from it went back to low-income households through, for example, an, an increase in the tax, a free tax income threshold. Um, it was, it was uh, um, the assistance to emissions in terms of trade is declined over time, so it ticked all the boxes, but it's really hard to say whether it was effective. And so that's why the key points, I think, for Australia are related more to the politics. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about politics through a number of pictures. So Kevin Rudd, um, the first instigator of the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme, famously said that climate change is um, the greatest moral challenge of our time. Um, and, yet, and that was what triggered him to, to create this emissions trading scheme. And yet he made one that the Greens considered so week that they call it a carbon pollution rebate scheme and at the same time in the opposition you can see here from this ABC News there was a meltdown because uh, many of the front bench politicians could not vote for an emissions trading scheme and so their leader Malcolm Turnbull who was actively negotiating with the government to get this carbon price through was toppled in the leadership spill um, and lost the leadership to Tony Abbott over this issue and so while Kevin Rudd you know, at one point said that this was the greatest moral challenge of our time. When it actually came to the crunch, he basically, as you can see in this cartoon, said, come back in a year, it's all too difficult. So either it's the greatest moral challenge or it's not. Uh, when Julia Gillard took over from him, she said, famously said, there'll be no carbon tax on the government I lead. And to be fair, it wasn't a carbon tax what she designed, but it did have this three-year fixed price term at the beginning of it, which equated to a carbon tax. And therefore, she was easily branded as a liar. And um, with the Prime Minister being a liar, that really backed up the government, the, sorry, the opposition's campaign of axe the tax. Um, 
and famously our, um, the leader of the opposition and for, for a time our Prime Minister Tony Abbott said climate change is crap and that the carbon tax is socialism masquerading as environmentalism and he really um, did well out of this campaign of, of looking to scrap the tax. Um, and ultimately, he did scrap the tax. He had to try three times to get it through Parliament, the repeal of the carbon price. And the reason I've shown this photo is because that um, at that time, there was um, one man who held the balance of power, one man whose party held the balance of power. It was the Palmer United Party. Clive Palmer was a mining magnate that got into Parliament um, and uh, was, as I said, held the balance of power. And Al Gore... Um, travelled to Australia, recognised that um, there may be an option to influence Clive Palmer's views and had some negotiations with Clive Palmer. And although he was unsuccessful in convincing Clive Palmer to vote against the repeal of the carbon price, he was able to convince Clive Palmer to um, support a number of other climate initiatives, such as renewable energy targets and the like. So that was relatively effective in that sense. Um, so I think the take-home messages from Australia are, are, are quite um, wide-ranging. The first one is perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, so the, if we had had a carbon price in place the first time when Kevin Rudd tried to get it through, we would have had a good three or four years of that and we would have been able to see that price signal. But it was voted against by the Greens. The Greens voted against it because it wasn't perfect. And I think if they had their time again, they might have changed that. I don't know. The second point I would make is don't put all your eggs in one basket. So when Julia Gillard finally brought in the carbon price, she said, well, we have a market mechanism now. And she got rid of all the other initiatives and programs that we had around climate change because a market mechanism should be pure and doesn't need those to operate. However, with the carbon price then being repealed, there was nothing else left behind the carbon price to sort of pick up the slack and reduce emissions. So that's the second point I'd make. The third point is that politics do matter. It didn't matter that um, the emissions trading scheme ticked all the required boxes. Um, it essentially... Uh, it essentially didn't have a chance of survival because of the politics that sat behind all of this. However, I would also say that individual people and politicians matter. So um, the independents were crucial in getting the carbon price into Australian legislation in the same way as Al Gore potentially played a really important role in keeping renewable energy targets, for example, in Australia. Um, also part of the politics is business and industry. So the carbon farming initiative, which is still in effect running today, was only successful because it benefited agribusiness. And so they were supportive and they were behind that scheme. Similarly, now in Australia, we're seeing a lot of business and industry coming out and saying we want a carbon price. Um, and they're going to have an important role in lobbying for, the, for that in the end. And so I guess related to that, my final point is that to get a carbon price through, we need to emphasise the benefits and the opportunities of these of a carbon price rather than the costs um, and the difficulty of getting one through. But happy to answer any questions on any of those issues or to compare to BC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, so that was very interesting to, to see the parallels between uh, Canada's experience or BC's experience and uh, Australia's experience. Um, I wonder if uh, if anyone on the call right now has questions. So if you want to submit those questions, you have a Q&A button. Uh, please submit those there. If you can't find that one, you can also submit them in the chat uh, that you probably have open on the, on the sidebar. Um, we'll be happy to take questions from anywhere you can send them. Um, and if you send a question, try and remember to, to just uh, tell us where you're from at the same time. So we're very curious to know where everyone's from on the call. Uh, we had a few questions that were submitted before the webinar, and perhaps we can start with some of those. Um, a few of you actually asked questions regarding uh, the you know carbon pricing at the regional level. Um, I know uh, some of that was, was uh, discussed, of course, British Columbia as an example, um, but I don't know if, if uh, Tom or you want to discuss this more specifically, so, uh, talking about more decentralized carbon pricing, uh, can that be effective? Is that the right way to go uh, in absence of the national agreements on uh, carbon pricing system? Well, I can say a few words about that. I think that 
of course, the optimum would be an international agreement where we took into account the needs of different countries, but at the same time put in place some form of international program that had a price on carbon that was uh, of global extent. Now, politically, that's going to be very difficult to do, but it might happen at some point in the future. If you shrink down to the regional level, I think it's really important for nations to have a, a national carbon tax. Uh, one of our problems or issues here in British Columbia was that other provinces in Canada, we expected that they would follow suit in relatively short order after 2008. That didn't happen. And that allowed the opposition parties who are opposed to carbon taxation to, to emphasize the, the hazard of the potential for economic dislocation if we raise our price to, to use fossil fuels and others do not. And so you need to remove that on a national scale. And certainly in British Columbia's case, a lot of our trade is with the United States as Canada has 85% of its trade with the United States. And so it would have been, I think, of great benefit to British Columbia if our adjoining states immediately to the south of us, uh, Washington and Oregon, as well as California, had gone more or less in lockstep with us. California did put a price on carbon indirectly through a cap and trade program. The state of Washington tried to do it last year and politically that failed. Uh, they had a referendum question that, that did not pass. Uh, there does remain, I think, a challenge um, to broaden the base. Um, and I hope that that will come in the future because you know we can use examples like British Columbia's successful carbon tax to say this works. It did not cause economic dislocation. We cannot find any negative economic impact anywhere in British Columbia from our carbon tax. Others should follow suit. Um, I think I would agree with exactly what uh, what Thomas said, the ideal solution is to have an international scheme with international standards. Um, we didn't face many of the BC based in Australia because we didn't have that concern of just across the border. There was no carbon price. It was uh, it was a national scheme, so uh, a lot more benefit in that way. But I think we would likely see a similar trend happening in Australia to BC, where if, if the national government doesn't act, then um, we'll see more action. We'll already see more action from the subnational level. But carbon price and carbon tax is a little bit of a difficult one now in Australia, given the history I've just described. But certainly the best solution is to have something um, of, at a higher level, as Tom said. Um, so we have, we have two more questions. One from Colin Rice, he's from Tampa, Florida. Um, he's asking, uh, was deregulation a selling point in pricing carbon? Um, if so, were there any negative side effects? Uh, I, can, I can speak from British Columbia's experience. Uh, no, it was not a selling point. There was, um, we did not deregulate here. In fact, we did bring in other legislation that imposed certain types of regulations uh, that had to do with, with energy efficiency, uh, carbon combustion, uh, vehicle efficiency, and that sort of thing. So, no, I would say deregulation is not a selling point. The selling point, though, that I think one can use to sell the whole notion of a carbon tax is to say, in fact, you don't say, if you're trying to sell this, you don't say, I'm going to impose a tax on you. What you do instead is you say, you walk into the room and you say, I'm going to lower your income tax or I'm going to lower payroll taxes or I'm going to lower pension costs or I'm going to lower something. And that's how you sell it. You don't walk into the room and say, I'm going to impose a tax on you. Rather, you walk into the room and say, I'm going to lower taxes. And then when someone says, well, wait a minute, you need the revenue. Then you say, well, yes, but we're going to tax pollution because it's harming us. It's harming our health. It's harming the health of our children. It's harming the health of our environment and our atmosphere. And by the way, I'm going to lower your tax burden. And you want the recipients 
to understand that the key word there is lower, not higher. And that's the key to selling it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think the deregulation is a big debate for us either. I'd agree again, I'd second everything that Tom said. Um, I think the other issue, certainly for business here, is transparency. So once you have a carbon price, it's 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 clear where the emissions are and who's doing the lifting and, and what you need to do in order to do better out of a low-carbon world. Um, if you have, I guess, um, other ways of doing it, not through the market, then you, you automatically get rid of that transparency. And government, uh, sorry, business, I think, would much prefer to be able to manage their own carbon than to be told... Um, you need to do it in this way or you need to do it in that way. Um, talking about uh, income tax uh, just a minute ago, uh, Robin Gunning was asking, uh, hi Robin, uh, she's asking, is income tax in Canada federally or province-based? Uh, Robin's from Australia. Uh, the answer is both, Robin. Uh, there is a federal income tax structure <laughs> across the country and the, the provinces impose their own um, income taxes as well, and those vary quite significantly across Canada. They're quite low in British Columbia, they're quite low in Alberta, they are quite high in Quebec, and they are quite high in Newfoundland Labrador, uh, for example. So you see quite significant differences across Canada in terms of the personal income tax burden, if you like to call it a burden, the, the price for joining civil society, if you prefer to look at it that way, does vary across the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we just discussed as well. Just to discuss, discuss. Um, um, I can hear myself. Hear myself. Uh, echoed in the back. Echoed in the back. Um, um, so so you were just, you were just uh, telling me uh, 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 how to how to do uh, carbon carbon uh, taxes, uh, taxes uh, carbon uh, pricing, how to pricing. regarding uh, and how to convince people really that that's a good idea. Um, can you can you guys still hear me well or yes I can hear you, okay. I can hear you now but I didn't get your question sorry oh. there, was, there was an echo when you're asking okay, your question. so it wasn't just for me okay um, so yeah we we're just talking about uh, communication uh, and, and carbon pricing so and this was uh, some of the questions that were submitted to us before the the, the, the webinar um, were on that topic so what's what's the best way to communicate this uh, what are the, the, the some of the best success stories we can we can use to communicate this and to and to confront resistance? Um, and uh, as part of that of that series of questions or, or that topic, um, people also want to know how will it impact everyday people? Because that's that's something that that people ask all the time when we talk about carbon pricing. So how is that going to impact me or my family? Um, you want to say a few words on that? Go ahead. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, so there are a few few issues in there. Um, I'll go to the last point first. How will it impact you and your family? Um, I think the the most salient example here is the European Emissions Trading Scheme, which is in place since two thousand and four. Similar to Australia, there was a really strong scare campaign around that emissions trading scheme, and when that was starting out. Um, it was going to be too expensive. People were going to have their lives destroyed because of prices of bills and because businesses wouldn't be able to cope and industry. Um, and a year later, a survey was done interviewing people on, on, on the effect of the carbon, of this emission trade scheme. And most people didn't even know it was in place yet. So has it happened? Is it in place? And I think that's the point. A lot of this is a scare campaign. As, as Tom made the point, um, a lot most of these schemes are designed so that those that are hardest hit um, are compensated for it so that that comes back into their pocket and, and they shouldn't feel the effect. And so, and in fact, in Australia, when the Abbott government got rid of the carbon price, they didn't get rid of the household assistance in a sense because they kept the low, their uh, tax income threshold. Um, so it's not, it, it shouldn't really affect households that much. It's more about, as, as again, as Tom said, a shift rather than a, an extra burden. It's just changing the way things are priced and letting the market um, internalise that externality. So um, reflect the actual cost of the carbon rather than just allowing it to affect um, our lives in, in non-tangible ways. 
But the other point is you asked about how the best way to communicate this, and that was the last point I went to on my slide, which is about really selling the opportunities of a carbon price. So certainly in Australia, um, this is an opportunity for Australia to lead in a low carbon world. We have such an innovative clean tech industry. It's an opportunity for us to be part of um, the new paradigm rather than the old paradigm. It's an opportunity also because a, car, a, a market mechanism, um, because of this signal, you can see things happening in a in a, um, a logical manner, and therefore you're less likely to have these surprises of, well, now we've changed the law, and and this and this industry is now defunct, is not going to be our function anymore. It's, well, we have a carbon price; it's going to go up over time, and therefore these businesses are going to going to find it more difficult if they don't change their way of operating and you've got that clear pathway ahead which means that we can pre be prepared to transition both economically and socially obviously no market mechanism is perfect um, but if it's done the right way and and ticks all the boxes I like I like the four that um, Tom puts out the unique comprehensive simple and effective um, if it ticks all those boxes then uh, then we can you know it can be done in a socially aware way. And the only thing I would add to that is that, and I would entirely agree with what Anita's point about the impact on families. In, in British Columbia, for example, I'll pick on the price of gasoline that one would use for passenger vehicles. In uh, 2008, the, the average price of gasoline in British Columbia was around $1.10 or so a litre. It went up to $1.50 a litre by June 30th of 2008, in response to an increase in the world price of oil, the carbon tax added just two cents to that. So it had gone up by over 40 cents a liter because of the world price of oil. The carbon tax added two and a quarter cents to that. It was almost invisible. After five years of increases in our carbon tax, we've added almost seven cents to the price of a liter of gasoline but the world market oil price has seen the price of gasoline in British Columbia fluctuate by as much as 50 cents a liter. So the carbon tax relative to the market noise or the market variability is almost invisible. People complain about it, but they don't know the quantum. They don't appreciate that it's seven cents. And when I ask students in my classes, how many cents per liter is the British Columbia carbon tax? Some of them will say one cent. Some of them will say 80 cents. They have no idea. But if I ask them a different question, did you anticipate that the price of gasoline would go up because of the carbon tax? They almost say universally say, yes, we expected it to go up. So they heard the word up but they didn't hear the number. They didn't hear how many cents per liter. And the important thing about the design, I think I'd like to emphasize this point again and again, is that you need to have the anticipation of a price increase. It needs to continue to go up over time. It doesn't have to be a very large number necessarily, but you need to get the message across that there is only one way to go over time and that's up. And it is that particular recognition that changed behavior in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. so, so we have uh, just a few minutes left and we received uh, two questions from Addy and Sydney, Australia. Um, one of those questions is for Tom. He says, you mentioned that no new employees were hired for the administration of the scheme. Can you please expand on how this was possible? Sure. Thank you for the question, Eddie. The, the way that the taxes imposed in British Columbia is that we already have existing excise taxes on fuels. So there already was gasoline tax, diesel tax, propane tax, natural gas taxes. The government simply said, <clears throat> we'll just change the quantum of those and we'll change them on an annual basis over five years. And so it's very easy for the Department of Finance just to turn a little knob and, and, and raise the tax rate. And so the uh, people who pay those taxes, the way it's set up in British Columbia is that it's the, at the wholesale level, 
that those taxes are paid. And so there was no need for additional employees to oversee that. The difference with a cap and trade program in that regard is quite profound because for a cap and trade program, you have to understand what your emissions are from a particular emitter. You have to verify what those emissions are. On an annual basis, you have to grant allowances, which is a diminishing number over time. You have to have auctions to set the price for those allowances. And someone once said to me, a European once said to me that the European trading system, which is a cap and trade program, when that came in, the principal beneficiaries were the large accounting companies, all of whom built new office towers just to, to uh, fill with their new carbon accounting staff. We didn't have to do that in British Columbia. Excellent. And, and Nita, is there a way to transition the ERF that we currently have into a pricing scheme, uh, bringing down the baselines and increase the scope? Uh, is that also from Addy? Also from Addy. Okay, thanks Addy. Um, before I answer that, I'll just um, go to Tom's point in the last question. That's absolutely right. Um, the difference between a carbon tax and an ETS is, is that administrative burden, less level of burden. Um, the tax will always be simpler. ETS will always be more um, administratively difficult. Um, however, unfortunately, Australia, we've seen that a tax will always have that. People will always want to lower a tax. So incoming governments will always have that in their pocket of, well, we can always offer to lower the tax. There's always going to be that push. Whereas an emissions trading scheme, once a company holds permits, they sort of have um, an incentive to keep the scheme in place. So there's a slight difference there as well. So perhaps some of that um, plays into it. Um, going to Addy's question, so Addy um, obviously knows uh, a lot about a bit about the Australian scheme. So the scheme we currently have in Australia is called the Emissions Reduction Fund or Direct Action. Um, and if you go back to my slides, you'll see on um, the one where I put a little bit of detail, it's actually based on the Carbon Farming Initiative. So the government, the Gillard government put in place an emissions trading scheme, a cap and trade, as Tom just described, and then gave the farming sector, the land sector, so farming and, and forestry, the opportunity to participate voluntarily in that scheme um, through the offset scheme, known as the Carbon Farming Initiative. Um, so the Carbon Farming Initiative only made sense as long as there was an emissions trading scheme. When the car emissions trading scheme was repealed, the CFI was sort of hanging there on its own. It, there were projects to reduce emissions, but no one to buy those, those projects and buy those credits. So the government turned that CFI scheme into the central scheme by saying, well, the government will buy those permits. So if you continue to reduce your emissions, that's great. In the land sector, we'll buy those emissions and that will be how we reduce emissions. Um, and then they expanded that scheme to not only cover the land sector, but also to include um, energy efficiency, energy conservation, changes in industrial processes. So they essentially made what was the offset scheme into the central scheme, and that's what we have now. The only way those permits get bought is by the government running what's called a reverse auction, so asking um, projects to bid in to who can reduce emissions the cheapest, and then the government will buy a certain number of those. So you, the government would actually argue that what we do have is uh, a pricing scheme. They would argue that rather than a cap and trade, we have a baseline and credit scheme, which is similar to what the international um, international scheme was under the Clean Development Mechanism. <clears throat> the, the difference is for a baseline and credit scheme to work, you need the baseline to bite. And the Australian baseline doesn't bite. It's too generous. Um, so industries don't have to work very hard to stay within their baseline. In fact, they can increase their emissions and still stay within their baseline. So the question is, how do we transition this into a pricing scheme? Very simply, those baselines need to bite. And more than that, they need to do, as Tom said, rather than say they need to go up, the price needs to go up, but the baseline needs to go down. So as long as... Um, industry knows that there's a baseline that it bites and it's going to go down periodically, whether it's on an annual two-year, five-year basis. Um, that's essentially what's needed to make 
what we have into a pricing mechanism. Now, I say that in a very general way. Once you go into the details, the actual legislation and how it takes effect is a little more complicated and the opposition would probably argue that it's not that easy to do um, and you would need to sort of start from scratch to make it work. But that's details essentially on the big picture, all you need to turn what we have now into um, a pricing mechanism is a, is a more is a, is a trajectory of tight baselines for emissions. Well, that, that was a very complete answer. Thank you so much. Um, I, I hope everyone followed. <laughs> um, one of the questions that we didn't really uh, um, uh, cover, but I want to make sure I give you a minute to, to try and address it uh, because a lot of people were asking about how to how to recycle or how to how to use the revenue from uh, carbon taxes and is it more efficient uh, if, if the revenue is paid back to the consumers versus as a dividend versus uh, used to, to improve the grid or to um, uh, spark innovation um, so what are your views regarding uh, the use of the revenues from carbon pricing? Well, it, it, that's a very interesting question and it's actually a philosophical question. I think the most important thing is that if you're going to put a price on the combustion of fossil fuels, which most people in the world use, you have to make sure that it's applied fairly. So, uh, what we did in British Columbia, as I pointed out, and, and, and other administrations have done the same thing. In fact, Julia Gillard did the same type of thing in Australia, is made sure that people of lower income status were appropriately compensated for the additional cost of combusting fossil fuels or using fossil fuels. What do you do with the additional revenue? In British Columbia, we chose to reduce the overall tax burden from corporate and personal income tax because economic modeling suggested that that would be the most effective way to reduce emissions while avoiding economic dislocation. In fact, strengthening perhaps the economy. Other administrations have taken a different role. Now, the recent imposition of a carbon tax in Alberta, our adjoining province, which began on January 1st of this year with a $20 a ton initial charge, there, what the, the provincial government has done is provide fiscal supports for low-income families and, and, in fact, middle-class families. So approximately 60% of Alberta families will receive compensation that will cover pretty much the entire cost of the carbon tax. But there will still be additional revenue. And what the Alberta government plans to do with that revenue is the sorts of things you alluded to, Audrey. They will invest quite heavily in public transit, for example. Uh, and they're also going to, in, to provide a, a billion dollars worth of supports over the next several years for renewable energy and the transition to renewable energy in Alberta. Alberta has a lot of wind resources and it has a substantial amount of sunlight and they want to really strongly encourage that. So they are going to take some of the carbon tax revenue and direct it directly towards supporting the growth of the renewable energy sector, while at the same time making sure that it is applied fairly in terms of the cost burden to be borne by families in Alberta. In British Columbia, we took a different, different track. In 2008, the decision was made that it would be revenue neutral. And you know, one could make arguments for both. I, I don't think that there's any um, benefit for, for any particular system either way, as long as you take care of those people who have low income. You must make sure that you're not in making their lives more difficult. Well, thank you so much. And that's actually a perfect segue uh, for, for the webinar that's coming up in a couple of days because there's going to be someone uh, speaking on behalf of Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, so I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss this further at the next webinar as well. Um, so thanks for being with us. Thanks, thanks to everyone who attended and special thanks to, of course, the, the panelists, Anita and Tom, that was uh, very interesting. And I hope everyone came with, you know, is leaving with, with some knowledge and inspiration. And I hope everyone feels a little bit more ready to go and lobby their, their own governments and uh, push for carbon pricing in their own jurisdictions. Um, so next webinar is uh, July 10 at 7 p.m.
uh, Canadian Eastern time, July 11 at 9 a.m. East Coast Australia time. So breakfast for the Aussies and uh, evening or, or sign cassette for, for us uh, Canucks. Um, it will actually feature uh, Danny Richter from Citizen Climate Lobby, as I mentioned. We'll have Kristen Miller from Eco City Builders and Ethan Spanner from Climate Reality Project. And it's actually going to be a uh, uh, sort of a kickoff to the Eco City uh, Builders, uh, sorry, to, to the, the Eco City um, events uh, that will be held in Melbourne uh, the following day. So thank you for joining us again and have a fantastic evening or morning wherever you are. Thank you all. Thanks.